actually retired with a year left on my contract. I was kind of had some medical stuff going on towards the end. I was getting beat up, but I did have one year left on my contract and I wanted to keep playing. I've played eight years. I always wanted to get 10, but I had a conversation with my financial advisor say, hey, if I retire, what does it look like? What can I spend? How much, what, what's my yearly? And so we had that conversation and um, that was kind of where that ultimately led to the decision to retire. Welcome to Beyond the Game, Wealth Mastery for Athletes. I'm Chris Benson, private equity real estate investor, and I'm joined by nine-year NFL vet Alec Ogletree. Beyond the Game is a podcast where we will provide a playbook for financial growth both on and off the field. Join us each week as we'll have in-depth conversations with other pro athletes as they walk us through how they've created wealth beyond the game both on and off the field. They're going to share their triumphs, lessons learned, and setbacks along the way so that you don't make the same mistakes. Join us. I think you're going to have a lot of fun. Today on Beyond the Game, we had Cincinnati Bengals legend Clint Bowling. Clint is eight-year NFL vet, played for Cincinnati the entire time, 2011 draft pick, came out of University of Georgia with Alec. Uh, great conversation. Clint's actually in the insurance industry now, but he talks about uh, a number of things that impacted him along his journey, uh, specifically his ability to go out and network, go out and meet people while he was playing to give himself a path uh, after football. So I think you're going to love this show. Should be a, a great one. Thanks for joining us. Clint Bowling, good afternoon. Welcome to Beyond the Game. Appreciate you taking the time today. Appreciate it. Looking forward to chatting with you guys. Should be a uh, fun podcast. It will be. It will be. Clint, I'm going to start with this question. I got, I got one for you. So it's 2000, uh, 2007. You're at University of Georgia, which is how you know Alec. We guys played together. You, man, you major in risk management and insurance. I just want to understand, how do you choose that as a 18, 19-year-old football player? Like You want to understand how to do risk management. Did someone t tell you to do that? Or was that on your own? Um, so I actually started in the business school. Um, my major originally was accounting. Um, and numbers have always just kind of been my thing. I, I was always excelled more in math than in reading and science in school. And I took an accounting class in, in high school, actually. My junior and senior year took an accounting class, did well in it. And then I started as an accounting major at Georgia and kind of midway through like a year, I was just like, accounting's not it. That's, uh, these are too many numbers. And, um, so I, I transitioned to, um, MIST kind of computer programming. Um, that lasted another year, but like all within the whole time I'm in the business school. So just taking different classes with a different focus. And then I ultimately settled on risk management insurance. So it took me three different, you know, majors before I finally ended up where I wanted to go. But the, the finale was the risk management insurance. What was the plan? Like, what were you thinking? Um, I always wanted to graduate through business. I mean, that was just through the business school, through Terry. That was my ultimate goal. And, you know, I it's one of those things, too. I've always kind of in the back of my mind, I was like, as long as I graduate from Terry, it doesn't matter if I'm a finance major, if I'm an accounting major, if I'm a insurance major, you have the opportunity to kind of go to whichever direction. But I knew I wanted to go business. And that was where I wanted to end up. Uh, down the road. But at the same time, I wasn't exactly sure it was insurance. I wasn't sure it was finance or what, but it was more of just a business background that I really wanted. And was that, was that based on just, you know, just kind of as you, before you got to Georgia or was it like, oh, why you were there, you know, because me personally, like, it was like, oh, uh, no, I'm going to take this housing and consumer economics type thing, right? So, yeah, I, me, like I said, personally, I was like, man, I'm here to play football and like, 
I can't be taking like some crazy classes, you know, because yes. of the schedule. Well, one, the schedule just kind of doesn't permit for a lot of, you know, guys to choose a bunch of different, you know, majors or whatever. Yeah. But at the same time, being that young and naive, you just kind of like, man, I don't really know what I want to do. But to me, what you just said kind of seems like you kind of had already a thought process yeah. going into it. You know, there's there's two answers to that question. The first answer I'm going I'm to start with is my dad had an accounting background. He was a uh, CFO for with car dealerships, and that's his background. Okay. And so I always kind of had that dream of like, ah, right, that's I want to go down some similar path of a business, or you know, I want to work within business. And so that was the first answer to one of the part of that question. The other side of it is I was a little three-star recruit. I wasn't the big five-star recruit like Alec was. So me being the three-star, I was like, man, I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy that Georgia offered me a scholarship. I don't know how long this whole football thing is going to work out. And I was, I was an undersized kid. I, I was, you know, I played my freshman year at like 275, 280. So I was undersized. And so I just, you know, it, I just never, when I got to Georgia, I didn't think I was going to play in the NFL until I started playing and getting better and working harder. And then it became a dream and then it became a reality. So like I always had this understanding that like, hey, football is not going to be forever. But I also didn't have like, you know, like I said, I wasn't a huge recruit, so I never had these on playing in the league type dreams, I guess, if that makes sense. No, it does. When, it does. when did that start, sense. Clint, for you? Because, I, I mean, Alec talks about it, too. Like, you know, he knew – I mean, he, he was a highly, a highly regarded recruit coming in, and he was, you know, getting looked at through school. For you at UGA – when did it start where you started to think about, oh, you know, I may be able to make a career out of this? It was probably my after my sophomore year. I came in as a freshman. And to be honest, you know, I really didn't think I was going to play as a freshman. I came in, I think we had nine recruits in our recruiting class, nine offensive line recruits, sorry. And so it was one, a crowd, they, they were looking for O-line help, but it was a crowded offensive line class. There were higher recruits than me. I was probably on the lower end, to be honest. There were four and five star guys above me. And, you know, looking back on it now, you're like, man, those stars don't mean anything. But at the time, they meant everything in the world. Um, and so, but fortunately, I was able to play as a freshman because I was smart. I was able to understand the offense, know where to be, when to be there, those kind of type things. So, I was able to play as a freshman because of that. But then it was after my sophomore year, I was starting to get some accolades and some all SEC kind of stuff. And I was just like, all right, in my, I started to be, I was like, this is a real dream to be able to go to the next level was after my sophomore year, I would say. Did, did that shift mindset for you? Like just as far as how you approach the game? I mean, did it, I don't mean to say, I mean, look, I know how much work, for you guys as division one athletes at a program like Georgia, how much work football is, but did it shift your mindset towards how you approached football? Not, not necessarily. I think it was more of a um, post Georgia. I could make this into a career. I can play in the NFL, but on a day to day of how I approach practice, how I approach workouts, I don't think it changed anything in that aspect. It was, you know, I was, you know, came into work, you know, came into practice, wanted to practice hard, wanted to work out hard. It didn't change anything. And that that was kind of what got me there in the first place. And so that was kind of my whole career, too, was, you know, working hard to get to where I wanted to be. Boy, did we work hard. <laughs> you were there, yeah, you were there with Coach T, right? <laughs> I, I, I missed Coach T. Um, so I never got to play. Oh, yeah, you did. So my last season was Coach Van's last year, and I was glad to be on the way out. Uh, but you know, we it, Coach T was a different animal. But at the same time, like I mean, we all worked hard. But Coach T, that I, I think I heard stories, and that was a whole another level. 
What and, you heard uh, was true. <laughs> yeah. and that was my that was going on my fresh or my rookie year in the NFL. And I'm sure it was different. Like, I don't know how it was for you, but I got to the NFL and we finished our first practice. And I looked around, I was like, was that it? Like, that was practice? Because Georgia, like, we got after it. I mean, we were out there for two and a half, three hours hitting, grinding, banging to the NFL. And you had like 25 plays in a practice. And I was just like, what happened? And uh, so it was a little bit different. And I'd be talking to all my buddies doing the Coach T workouts. And I was like, I ain't doing that here in Cincinnati. I'll tell you guys that. (laughs) (laughs) So they can take advantage Uh, of you young college kids. Once you guys got start to get paid, everybody gets an attitude. Yeah. Chris, this was like, Orange Theory on steroids. <laughs> it's like good that little for you. one hour burn, you get like workout. You go to if you go to Orange Theory, they kill you like that. But imagine, imagine doing like ninety percent of your max, every like day. every other day. Yeah, eighty <laughs> percent for for like you know six, seven, eight reps. Everybody, everybody was everybody good. like. Yeah. Didn't matter if you're a receiver or a lineman, you were getting under the squat rack and putting heavy weight on your back. Everybody. And you dressed in all black uh sweatsuits, like <laughs> we had to, we had, he us with all black long sleeve sweatsuits, like and pants and everything. So it was we're better for it now, I would say. Absolutely. It's, it's like, fun to look back and <laughs> talk about. <laughs> Yeah, it's exactly. it's interesting though. Like think think about it this way, Alec. Like most people don't understand what like work to failure is. Yeah. Right? People just haven't had that experience. Most right, and you know people who've had some athletic ability and maybe been through that. You guys at a whole different level than me. But like my wife owns a gym, and it's a personal training like studio type of setup. So you know I see people and they're like, oh this is really hard. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And and what it always translates to me, it's like, well, then what do you think is hard work in work? <laughs> like, career wise, like, you guys know what it is to literally have nothing else. Like, you've given it all. And now you're just a heap of mass on the ground. And what I always think about is how soft people are just kind of in the general world. And the, how does that translate to what you do on a day to day basis? I'm not just saying work anything. It's like, well, you don't even understand what it means. I think there's huge value in like that. Oh my God, I'm going to die. And then the other flip side of it, like, I mean, we would do those every day almost. I mean, those like mat drill workouts that we would do in February. I mean, we did that three or four days a week at four thirty, five 5 o'clock in the morning, whatever time it was, where you, you were literally physically spent before your day even most people's day even starts at 6 30 like you were laying and then guess what you're going to wake up and do it again tomorrow so i mean that's one of the things doing everything else comprehend yeah And, and and everybody also doesn't understand how much work professional athletics is right even division one like you guys i mean it's a job like you guys are going to work every day and you have to be students People don't understand how much work you guys put in. Everyone sees the flash, but it's really hard to understand the amount of time, energy, effort that that you guys repped to get where you were. And I guess I mean that's know, to everybody. Everybody doesn't get an opportunity to see, you know, everything that you do behind closed doors. Like we don't see everything that you do over there reliant. It doesn't mean you're not working hard. Whatever people may look at you and be like, oh, that's I can do that. That's easy. But in reality, no, it's it's not as easy as you think it is. Yes, I make it kind of seem more easy because I'm here every day practicing rep- repetition, repetition, you know, and that's kind of part of part of the thing, you know, what you learn, I guess, kind of in the business world as well, it, as well is like, no, you have to put in those that 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 work like you got to put those hours in. Like even those days that suck, and especially those days that suck, yeah. you know, because we all you still have it. No matter if you, and it's, like I said, it's not really just solely strictly for sports. 
the real world, it's, it's still the same thing. Like, no, you got to wake up, got to go to job. You got to go do whatever you're doing. And, and if you want to be successful at it and at a high level, you know, you're going to put that work in. You're going to spend days and hours and hours and hours where people couldn't even comprehend the amount of time that you put in it, you know? So, yeah, we, you know, we've I, talked I about on here, like that. Clint, a bunch, like the idea of 10,000 hours to make an expert, right? If you've read the book Outliers, yeah. you know, everybody's got to put the 10,000 hours in and nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody wants to, but most people don't. And I think, yeah. you know, coming back to you and in, in your career, it's, it's, you put your hours in, you did the work. That's why as an undersized kid and three-star recruit, you had a, a pretty incredible career as an NFL player, I guess, transition us to where as you were coming out to the draft, this is something that Alec and I joke around with a bunch about his experience, but you can you came out in the fourth round and in the time you came out were dollars slotted. How did it work then? Like, was everybody getting based on the spot you came in? Yeah. So my, uh, my draft was a pretty unique experience actually, because there was the, uh, it was in 2011. It was the year of the lockout uh, where they were having the uh, collective bargaining uh, agreement. The owners physically locked out the players saying, Hey, you are not allowed to work. We're taking away your insurance. We're taking away your benefits. You guys are on your own. And to, and so it was a unique experience since me to be coming out that year. Um, and, you know, I remember getting drafted by the Bengals talking with Marvin Lewis and he basically says, Hey, with the lockout and everything going on, you know, we were drafting you, but we're not going to be able to talk to you again. So when the lockout's over, we'll talk to you later. They hang up. And I never heard from anybody again for like four months. And yeah, so he- and so then that's I got, April, right? So what are you doing? You just working I out? Just, they basically they said that I talked to the O line coach too, and he says, "Hey, continue to work out, keep training, doing what you're doing. We'll call you when the lockout's over." And so this was in April, I believe. And so the lockout ended at the very end of July. So I missed OTAs, all those off season things that guys would typically do. We weren't allowed to do rookie mini camps and do that. I got a phone call like July 30th from our offense line coach. First time he goes, Hey, lockout's going to be over officially tomorrow. You need to be up in Cincinnati in two days. I was like, okay. So I basically packed up all my stuff, drove up there, stayed in a hotel for like a month until I found a place to live and all that other stuff. So it was a, uh, it was a unique experience. What, what did fourth round draft picks get paid? Uh, sorry. So going back to answer your question, that, the year I came out, they had just reslotted everything. They had just gotten rid of all of those first round, uh, crazy first round deals to where everything was slotted. And um, my, and then the fourth round, everything was slotted. Um, I mean, it just kind of trickled down to the farther down in the draft that you went. Got it. Did at, at that point, this is something we we've talked about with a lot of guys is did, what were you thinking about money? Like foundationally, if your dad was a CFO, right, you, you had a good foundational knowledge. I'm sure around the dinner table at night, you probably got more financial education than most of us did as kids. Um, I'm, I'm you know, especially with an accounting background, but what were you thinking about as you entered the NFL from a, you know, take the football piece out of it. If you can, I know you, you're going to about to be flooded with information on the football side of things, But was there a thought process around like, all right, if I can build a career, here's my plan money wise, or was that something you evolved into? Um, It was, to be honest, I did not have a plan. Um, You know, I remember getting my signing bonus and asking where half of it went. Um, I I talked to my dad. I was like, hey, they said they were going to pay me, uh, you know, X and I got Y. Where is it? And he's like, welcome to taxes, son. And (laughs) And so uh, that was a little eye opening. Um, I always remembered playing and doing the math. And I said, all right, if I play out this contract and I never play again, I can have a million dollars in the bank and I'll never have to do anything again. Like I basically thought that like, if I had a million dollars, I could, that would last me forever. And I would never have to work again if I didn't want to and X, Y, Z. But um you know, I, I, 
I bought a house my second year. That was always a big goal of mine. I was like, hey, if I can get out of this thing with a house, and then, you know, I'm not going to have a million. But, but so like that over time, my the plans have changed. But going out, I was I mean, I was so wide eyed without knowing anything, didn't understand a concept of taxes, even though my dad was an accountant. You know, you had never really gotten paid, though, and I never physically saw it affect me. You know, you hear about it, you hear people talk about it, but it hadn't actually affected me until that point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's so that's so funny because literally I said the exact same thing. I was like, man, I got my check, and I was like, this is not nothing compared to what they say it was paying me. Yeah, and then I'm looking at it like you said, you see all these tax things coming out, and it's like deductible here. You got miscellaneous stuff over here. You got X Y all these kind of different little things that they put on your on your on your check that's kind of breaking down what they done took already mm-hmm. before you even cast a check. Yeah. <laughs> it's like man, I was like, bro, this is this is like wow, this is yeah. this is crazy. You know, so it's it's funny that you say that because it's like, yeah, you had an account in your in your in your home with your dad and everything, yeah. but it's like, no, I get here and I'm like I don't have a clue what the hell is going on with these taxes. But it's it's like anything else in life. Like you make the sit, like you hear other people, you get other opinions, but until something directly affects you, you don't really, it doesn't, ah, that I don't, I'm not worried about that. Or I'm not worried about this political policy. I'm not worried about this city council policy until it affects you. That's when you start, you know, I I need to get involved in, figure out what's going on and um you'd have a little more better understanding than when you first started no for sure so i guess the kind of key as we keep moving forward here um just talk a little bit about like okay you go through let's just say you get you play eight years right so let's just take you to year year five right so you reach a new contract so did you sign you signed two contracts right yeah or did you two. do i played my, played my rookie deal out and then re-signed in cincinnati for a five-year deal okay so you go you you on in that in that second contract right that's where you know most guys try to get to to that second contract after the first one because the first one is kind of like you know, yeah. you get it and you're like, man, oh, I got this much money. I got this. Okay. I got a bunch of things I need to do. Yeah. You get to the second one. You're like, okay, you kind of got to, to me, you kind of have more of an understanding of what I guess kind of is going on around you in a sense with that. And then you, you try to, I guess you start planning. Like you're like, okay, I can take this and I can go do this. Were there any type of things that you were already into doing, uh, prior to your second contract or did you wait till you get to your second contract and you were like, okay, I'm going to start, I'm going to go look at insurance. I'm going to look at real estate. Oh, whatever it is. Um, on an investment side, um, it, I would say I w I wish I did a little bit more outside of the mold that I was in. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I was conservative, you know, I had an advisor, we were, mutual funds, stocks, um, a little bit of some alternatives, um, hedge funds, but all within that same umbrella. Um, I wish I took some more like chances with um, maybe a startup or a company that was looking for some investment money and different things like that, where there was a little bit more risk, but more upside because I would have been comfortable taking on a little bit more risk than I did. Um, But looking back on it, you know, the end of the day, I bought some real estate, but it was more of like personal, like, hey, I'm going to buy this real estate. And that's going to be where I end up building a house later on in my career. Um, You know, I had a house down in my first house that we lived in down in Dunwoody. I had some real uh, roommates and different things like that. But it was never like, I'm going to flip these kind of houses and move on. But I've always made, I've done pretty well in real estate in different aspects. What, yeah, no. Clint, take when you got to that second contract, and I mean, at that point, too, you're 20, what, 25, 26? I mean, you got yeah. a little bit of maturity with you, too. And and that's something we've talked about a bunch is like, man, you guys get this chunk of cash when you're so young and immature and have the least amount of experience. It's hard to make good decisions. <laughs> with With you specifically, 
like you mentioned the million dollar number. And then as you went along, you probably realized, all right, well, that's not as much money as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Was, was there ever, did you think about it? Like, Hey, I got to get to this number. Or did your financial advisor say, Hey, get me to 5 million in the bank and I can create enough passive income off of that for you to live forever. Was there ever like a target for you? Um, yeah, it was always, you know, I, I remember early on in my career, I kind of did it, you know, you always look up to some old older guys in the locker room. You would start chatting with them, like we were. We've talked about a little bit where, hey, what are you doing with your money? And I remember always telling one of the guys his locker was next to mine that I always wanted to have a million dollars in the bank. And he'd been playing for a little while. He'd done pretty well for himself. He goes, just wait till you get the first though. He goes, you're gonna want another one, and then another one, and then another one. He's like, so it doesn't. You know, there was always a mark where I think in my head where if I could get there, I could get enough passive income. I'd like to be able to live debt free, um, you know, where I didn't have to, I, I didn't want to borrow money um, to get to where I wanted to go. And that was a big goal of mine was to be able to get to a certain point with uh, amount of money in the bank and be able to be debt free. And that was my ultimate goal when I was done playing football. Debt free across the board. Real across estate board. you owned. Yeah. Cars. I mean homes, cars, just I I don't owe anybody anything. Agreed. I'm, I'm saying exact same way of life. Besides I hated taxes. that. <laughs> yeah. It's like is, yeah. Is is it Clint, as you kind of approach the end of your career, and, and again, eight years in the NFL, you had a, a fantastic career all with one team, which is all also pretty unique. Did When you walked away, did you make enough money where you said, all right, if I'm smart with this, I never have to work again? Or were you in a position where you said to yourself, I think I'm okay, but I got to go get a job and kind of supplement that? I mean, again, you're probably 29, 30 when you walk away, so you, you, you probably have more to give. Yeah, so I actually retired with a year left on my contract. I was kind of had some medical stuff going on towards the end. I was getting beat up, but I did have one year left on my contract, and I wanted to keep playing. Um, I, I played eight years. I always wanted to get 10, but I had a conversation with my financial advisor say, Hey, if I retire, what does it look like? How much, what can I spend? How much, what, what's my yearly? And so we had that conversation and um, that was kind of where that ultimately led to the decision to retire that and the medical part where it's just like, Hey, I don't have to work anymore if I don't want to. Um, not now that's changed since then. But at the end of the day, if I didn't want to work, I, you know, I'm comfortable enough to to live a life to where I can just live. But mm -hmm. that's not maximizing your time and, you know, setting good examples. Yeah, you got to have a purpose. Absolutely. I, I think the thing the thing that I talk about, too, with with my own kids is you're you're use or you're saying it just in a different way. But burn rate. Right. It's just about understanding how much money do you spend on a monthly basis to live the lifestyle you want. Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know. A hundred grand a month, that could be 10 grand a month. It could be a hundred bucks a month. It doesn't matter. But if you can create enough income from investments to cover that with whatever lifestyle you want, you have freedom. And and I think what's interesting is as you get older, and I'm older than you guys, but that's all you really want. It, the stuff and the money piece, it, it loses its luster when you're fortunate enough, I guess, to make some. But what everybody I think seeks is that freedom. And like you said, the only way to do it is you know, be debt free. So you're not beholden to anybody. And then two, if you can create enough passive income to, to cover your burn rate, well, then works the choice. Yeah. And and generally, you can do stuff that you want to do versus stuff that you have to do. And, you know, in your case, if you got medical issues, and you don't want to go beat your body to hell anymore, you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a go ahead out. No, go ahead. Finish what you was going to say. No, I was just going to say it's a it's a good feeling, um, you know, to like you said, the want versus the have to. Um, you know, I don't have to do anything. I want to do this. That's a uh, that's the biggest difference. And like you said, purpose. You want to have a purpose, no matter what you're doing. You want to set examples for your kids. You want to have a purpose. You want to be able to wake up every single day and say, "All right, this is this is what I'm going to accomplish, and this is what I'm going to be doing going forward." Yeah. No, that's that's exactly right. Um, you kind of mentioned a little bit um, about 
about you was talking to, you know, some guys in the locker room, like, I guess your locker mate or I don't know whoever it was. Um, but so kind of the same thing for me. So like when I came into the league, like I had guys like James Arnottis, uh, Jolan Dunbar, Will Witherspoon, um, a couple older guys in the, in the, in the room, right. That were kind of took me under their wing along with the other, you know, rookie linebackers and stuff like that. And, you know, some, a couple of times, like, yeah, we, we had an opportunity to kind of pick those guys brains, right. Cause they've been in there, you know, six, seven, eight years or whatever, whatever the case may be. And, you know, still playing. And obviously they have kind of done stuff off the field that, you know, it kind of inspired you to be like, man, like, that might be something I might be interested in doing, whether it's real estate or whatever. So I guess kind of, did you have a mentor or was it more so just kind of, you know, you just talk to guys, you just had open conversation like that because most of the time you don't get the opportunity to really yeah, you know, freely talk, you know, kind of like that. But yeah, you know, I would all, one thing enough to have guys. Yeah, the uh, the guy that sticks out in my head is Andrew Whitworth, um, who's recently retired. He played. I mean, he was he played a he was in the league when I got there, and he was still in it when I left. I mean, he played fourteen or fifteen, maybe. And uh, but he is the best example of a leader that I've been around. Um, yeah, you know, he worked hard on the field. He had ultimate command and respect in the locker room. Everybody looked up to him. And he was the guy that kind of, when I first got to Cincinnati, that helped me, took me under his wing, would go to his house and eat dinner with his family, that kind of stuff. So seeing him, like, he was the guy that I really looked up to. Um, and then just kind of piggyback on that thing. I mean, the you talk about the locker room and guys sharing what they're doing and financials and the amount of money that they make. I mean, there's no more candid place than the locker room. I mean, they there's pretty guys are open about what they're making, what they're doing with their money. If they went to the casino and won, they want you to know everything, and they're very open. You know, it's a different atmosphere. It's I think it's just different too when you can look up online and see how much money a guy's making there. So they just don't really care if you know because everybody knows. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Did agree. What what were the things that you saw guys who struggled with it? What what were the challenges? And and maybe you struggled with it too earlier in your career. I mean, it sounds like you're a pretty conservative background. Your dad's an accounting major. I'm sure he kept you on the straight and narrow. It sounds like maybe your financial advisor was also conservative. What what are some of the habits you see guys struggle with, or just things that you know you wish you had it back? Um, you know, for me, for seeing other guys and the mistakes, I, I would say it's more of like extravagant purchases of, you know, you'd see a Bentley and then it would be sold in six months or you would, and they're like, Oh, I, I broke even on it. No, you didn't. Cause you pay taxes, you paid insurance for it a little bit. Like you didn't, you didn't break even on it. You paid some out of cost to pay, to drive that car around. And like, so like that was the biggest thing where you could see I you know I remember guys coming around with a I saw one teammate that had a Lamborghini for like a year and a half. I'm like you were literally driving around in a house. That's and so those are the big I I would say that's where it gets away from guys so quickly is the extravagant purchases and then continuing to live the lifestyle once they're done. When you're done, you can't continue to live that way. You you might be able to do it while you're playing, but once you're done you have to go back to living a life that like, hey, you could live a great life if you live under these parameters. You're not in an NFL locker room anymore, so you don't have to keep up with anybody else. But it's just that that that's the biggest thing is they continue to live the way that they live after the fact. Mm -hmm. It's that burn rate, right? It's it's just understanding like, look, I got 10 million bucks in the bank. My advisor says he can give me 10 percent a year. I can live off a million bucks. I got to be I got to be under that every month. Otherwise, I, I'm on a ticking time bomb. We, we had a guy on Alec when Craig Brown was on, you know, he talks about laying it out for guys and literally saying, all right, here's what you spend a month. This is the day you're going to run out of money. 
Like, here it is, black and white. And he said, even at that point, you know, you got to meet people where they are. And some guys aren't ready yet to hear it. Mm -hmm. But there's always a moment, you know, there's a moment where you have that realization, you're like, oh, shit, like, I am going to run out of money. And and then I got to get a job. And then it then clinic goes back to what you said is, do I want to or do I need to? Yeah, it changes the perspective a little bit. Is is there a deal, Clint, that that you wish you had back? Worst investment you've ever made, either on the investment side or it could be uh, cash you spent. Either way, um, you know, for the most part, I've done I've done pretty well. Like you know, the the first house that I purchased, uh, I was fortunate to make money on. Um, you know, there's no, there hasn't been any major financial, you know, I would say probably with it's happened, ironically, it's happened probably the last few years when the market's been down 21 and 22, probably spent a little bit more than we should have at those point in times. But at the end of the day, um, overall, like we, we've done pretty well, um, you know, especially most at the end of most seasons, it's kind of a unusual, you'd have a, uh, you know, an influx of cash because you just got paid over 17 weeks. So you have your whole salary within 17 weeks. And so in January, I'd always meet with my advisor and say, hey, where are we going to put this money? I need X amount to get to next season. What are we going to do with the rest? And uh, we we did go pretty heavy into some stocks. And like I said, that looking back, that would be my biggest, like, I would like to take a little bit of more risk early on to see how that would have played out. But that was probably my biggest complaint or mistake was to say, I wish I took more risk early on. You know, at the end of the day, I didn't know I was going to sign a second contract or what I was going to end up making, but I wish I, I took more financial risk earlier, but I, you know, that's not the case for everybody. I would say. Yeah. No, nah. I mean, it's, you know, you got it. Everybody has their own, you know, tolerance for risk at that, at, at, you know, whatever they're doing. So at the end of the day, you know, you was, at that time you were looking at you like, man, no, like yeah. I don't need, I don't need to do that at this point. And, and to, to your point, like a lot of people need to be like that. Like, yeah, no, I don't need to go out here and like you said, make those crazy purchases. Like, dude, you got drafted behind me. You make less than me and you drive a yeah. <laughs> $300,000 car. Yeah. Like, it's no way. It no way. It's no way you're saying this make it made any sense, you know, for you to buy. Whether you yeah. just wanted to have the car or whatever, it was like, no, I know, I know for a fact that like you're playing for free for the next couple of weeks here. Yeah, <laughs> you just spent order, all your you money on this you car. Know exactly what they're making. You know, they know what you're making. You can see. Like, man, that doesn't add up with that car and that lifestyle. And I know how much you've made the last year or so. Like, you see those things. And that's just the hardest part is the, to see those crazy purchases and the new the new chains and different things like that. So, I've seen Clint, do you, know, do you know Ronnie Brown? I mean, I know you probably know the name, but do you know him? I don't He's know in him personally, no. So we had him on the show. He's a financial advisor at UB, uh, for a, a firm in uh, in Buckhead. And he talked about when we asked him, like, worst money you wish you had back. And he's, he was a really conservative guy, especially financially. But he said right out of school, he bought a grill, you know, like a diamond grill for his teeth. And I was like, wait a minute. I, I don't even understand how that works. He's like, what are you talking? He's like, it's like a mouth guard with diamonds. <laughs> I was like, what do you do with it? He's like, I just put it on and I'll go out and be flashy in the clubs. And he said that that's the one he wishes he had back. I was like, where is it today? He's like, ah, I don't know. It's in a safety deposit box somewhere. He's like, what do I do with it? He's like, nobody wants my my old worn grill. Yeah, that's not something you can resell, I would say. <laughs> I mean, you could. It's yeah. some crazy fan. I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that might be true. That's a, some crazy fan. I'll buy I got this. Alec made an offer. Alec was going to try to get it secondhand. We yeah. could wear it on the next show. Slightly used. <laughs> Slightly oh, used right. Ronnie Brown grill. Clint, well, you talked about finding purpose a after the fact. So when when you retired, uh, did, you, did you come out in 2019? Did yes. you retire in 2019? Yep. What, how did you find that? Or what's the path you've been on since? Uh, so it's kind of the – so I retired in 2019 um, – 
you know, it was kind of a unique timing. Um, I hung out all of 2019. I traveled with my family, went back to some Georgia games, um, did different things like that. And it was January of 2020. I kind of started looking around for some work and figuring out what I was going to do. And uh, about two months later, COVID happened, started, I guess. And at that point in time, I was just like, well, scratch the working thing because I don't know what's going on in the world right now. Um, and so it was just kind of a really weird timing when I got done. Um, in 2020 and 21, I ended up playing a lot of golf. And I also started coaching at a high school uh, for two years um, with my former high school coaches, um, which was a ton of fun. I really enjoyed it. But after the second year of doing that, I really wanted to go a different direction and find um, some work. There was, um, you know, my kids were like, Daddy, are you going to play golf today? Or what do you do? And, you know, I really just wasn't maximizing my time. And so after that um, is when I started looking into some jobs and different things like that. And so since then, um, almost going to be about two years into a uh, insurance job. I work for uh it's called Reading Private Client. We're a small boutique group, but we deal with high net worth personal lines insurance. Um, and so I'm about two years into that. Um, and I've enjoyed it. It's been fun with the insurance background. That was the direction that I wanted to go. And um, at the same time, um, you know, it, it being in sales, it gives you a very flexible schedule, which is very desirable. And, um, you know, with, with young kids, that's been the biggest thing was just being able to juggle scheduling with your kids and being in a flexible schedule like that has been desirable. And that's what I've been doing about the last two years now. Hmm. See, the risk, talk risk, and insurance, like risk and insurance, risk management insurance degree plus, yeah. like, paid off. So it's, I'm, it's personal paid insurance, yeah. <laughs> right? And is, is there, sorry, go ahead, Alec. Oh, no, I was saying like, so it's personal insurance. Can you talk a little bit about like when you say high network, like, I guess kind of what does that mean? So it's, it's obviously you're not like accepting everybody, right? Because, yep. you, you know, you only want to work with a certain few, I mean, a yes. certain clientele. So the the best way to describe it is so, like I said, we're, we're a small group. We work with a few different carriers, um, Pure, Chubb, Berkeley One. Uh, are probably our, our bread and butter and the ones that we work with the most. But it's the biggest way to the best way to describe it is it's outside of, you know, the one insurance that everybody knows is State Farm. Um, State Farm is a volume model. They want to write everything they can. And then that's the way that they offset their losses and their risk is by volume, where these carriers will kind of offset some of their risk by a selective model. Um, they're you know, housing prices are specifically tailored for like $2 million and above houses. They would be more competitive where you can get better coverage on a house that's $4 million with one of these carriers versus with a state farm. Because at a certain point, state farm really is just going to kind of price themselves out like, hey, we'll write that 4 or $5 million house, but we really don't want to. We're going to charge exponentially more. Um, they can also do higher liability limits. So let's say, you know, you, for some reason, you're worried about being sued. Maybe you're a little bit more high profile. They can write $25 million umbrella policies, excess liability policies, where some of these other carriers will max out around $5 million. So there's, there's differences between each. And, but at the same time, they're also more selective. So if you're trying to switch from a, travelers or state farm but hey i have two or three accidents i have a couple claims i got two speeding tickets the carrier is going to say it might be a great account might be they have a ton of insurance uh, would need a ton of insurance have a great premium but that's not a risk that we're going to want to take on because mm -hmm. they're not responsible drivers they're not responsible homeowners and different aspects like that and so that would be the the you know quick story sales pitch of the biggest difference between what we do versus you know a state farm or nationwide or you know auto owners and different carriers like that and what is it called again reading Re private client it's r-e-d-d-i-n-g and um 
the way I actually got started with them is uh, it's a woman's brokerage group uh, who started it. And she actually works with some Cincinnati connections there. And so when I was wanting to start working, I was uh, <clears throat> catching up with a person from the Bengals in their front office that I got to be close with while I was playing. And I told him this is what I was, you know, hey, I'm looking for something. I'm right. I'm ready to start working. And he knew about my insurance background. And he's like, hey, you should meet this woman. She's actually out of Atlanta. Um, she does our insurance. Why don't you end up talking with her and see uh, see what direction it goes? And so from there, yeah, I've been doing that for about the two, last two years since then. That's awesome. Good. That's a, I mean, Good for you, man. That's a big thing, too. Like just having those connections that, you know, that you meet in the league throughout life, whatever it is. And, you know, you never know where that's what those connections can take you, you know? And I try to tell, I'm like, man, you, you should meet these people because yeah. and you need to, you know, talk to them respectfully and do all this stuff. Like, yes, you, you know, a lot of, while you're in the league, yes, we are taken care of, like, you know, better than a lot of people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but it doesn't, it doesn't shield you from once you're done playing, like, now the back out here in this real world, and he's like I said, you'd be like, I'm looking for work. I need, I need something. And if you have those connections like that, it does, it it can lead you to, you know, whatever the, the next the next step in your life that you want to do. And I always I always think that's key, you yeah. know, when when you're playing. Like the biggest thing too is just like, you know, when you go to di like as a player, when you go to different events, maybe it's a charity event, or maybe you're talking to the people at the uh, in the front office, you don't know, you're not playing football forever. So at some point in time, you're going to need another job. So how do they view you as a person and not a football player? Do they And then when you're at this charity event and you're talking to this person or they maybe they purchased a foursome in a charity golf tournament that you're playing in, well, this person's clearly successful enough to purchase, a, a you know, the how, whatever the package is to play in the tournament. They're successful in their own right, off the like completely outside of football and whatever business ventures that they do, you know, engage those people and talk with those people and build, like you said, build those relationships because at the end of the day, you don't ever know who's going to be able to help you down the road. And they like talking about them. Like mm -hmm. most of the time they like talking about themselves and what they do. Like yeah. as I, as as cool as it is for them to, you know, kind of talk to us about football or whatever, but you know, football is, is football. Like this is something that's been around for the longest. If you want to learn how to play it, you can you can play it. You can go outside of your backyard and play. Yeah. Everybody can't just wake up and go start doing insurance <laughs> and start doing it. You see what I'm saying? Like it's just everybody's it's childhood kind of dream, thing. Alec. I'm gonna uh, be an insurance agent someday when I grow up. That's everybody's childhood dream <laughs> when they're in the backyard. You never know. Some people play <laughs> some people pretend they're in Super Bowl. Some people will pretend they're doing insurance. At Clint, oh, I sure. think you just hit a huge point, Alec, which is like you guys are uh, – relevance not quite the right word I'm chasing, but everyone wants to talk to you when you're playing because you're cool, yep. right? Like NFL athletes or any professional athletics, people want to interact with you, and you have this huge opportunity to create an incredible network. And, and I love the saying, you know, network is your net worth because there's a time in your life where you're going to need people for whatever. It may not be a job, but for something. And and for me personally, I know I've spent a lot of time trying to get a great network because it, it also makes everything so smooth in your life because you know somebody who does that. That's what my wife always says to me. She's like, you always have a guy. Like there's someone I can call or reach out to and say, like, hey, I'm thinking about this. I know you did this. How's it work? Yeah. Or can you get me referral? And I think for you guys too, as athletes, you have this window where you can network and everybody's going to want to take your call. And, you know, when the, when you stop playing, that goes away a little bit, but you can still tap into those people, Clint, like you said, that you made an impact on, you know, at the charity golf tournament or wherever it may be. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're always going to, you're never going to not need help. You're never able to do anything by yourself. You're never able to complete some investment completely on your own. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're going to have to get help 
from with different people and to have a network and a circle of people that you trust and that you know and that they're giving you the best advice possible. I mean, that that information is invaluable and you can't uh, just to have trust in different people. That's the biggest thing. And, you know, things that you can't, you know, fake or you can't make up on your own. Like you, you just got to be able to, you know, trust that these other people are going to take care of you. No, I, I got a question to take us out with Alec. Clint, tell 25 year old you, or maybe 23, 23, 24, whenever you were ready to hear it, what, what resources, it could be a book, podcast series, a mentor, what, what would you tell you to go consume or get ingrained with to help accelerate the journey you're on right now, right? You know, one, I'd like to go back a little, maybe even farther, um, you know, going back to the school and the insurance and the, I do, like, there was a certain point in time where I did get checked out a little bit more than I would have liked. I wish I invested more time, especially like in high school, like you talk about, Alec, you go back and talk about like, you know, I was there to play football at Georgia, like in high school, once I got committed I was there to go. I wasn't there to go to high school anymore. I was there to go to Georgia at all. And that was one, like, I wish I, I applied myself academically more than I did looking back on it. Um, because now that I'm on the other side of football, I wish that I applied myself a little bit more in that aspect, but, um, really just not to be afraid to take on a little bit more financial risk than I did to have a little bit more risk tolerance that I did. Um, you know, looking back, um, I don't be afraid to go talk to anybody, um, at any point in time, ask them, you know, you see somebody that you found interesting in a charity event or some kind of function or a party, just don't be afraid to go talk to anybody and ask them like, Hey, what do you do for a living? I'm curious. I'd love to hear, have a conversation with you and see what have you done to get to where you are. Um, and to take on those, you know, don't be, don't just kind of sit there and check the box of like, yeah, I have to be here and I'm going to, I need to go. I'm tired and I want to go back home, but you know, just to apply yourself in every little thing that you do really. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. No, no. Um, I guess before you go, where um where can you know if somebody wanted to get in contact with you whether it be Instagram Facebook LinkedIn I don't care you know anything but just kind of you know um, shout out so I don't whatever, have a, yeah, contact I you. don't have a huge social media presence um, no Facebook no Instagram I have a Twitter account I don't tweet I like it for the news um, but I have a uh, I have a LinkedIn page that I do check for work more often. Um, and that would be the probably one of the best ways, uh, whether it's through LinkedIn. Um, OK, you can find our company website, readingprivateclient.com. Um, I have some contact information on there. Um, but, you know, not a big Instagram guy, not a big Facebook guy. Uh, I try to live life a little bit outside of social media, but I do like I guess it's X now. I do like X oh, yeah. for my news. That's a great, Okay. that's how I source my news at least. Oh, no, you got to be careful on that. <laughs> <laughs> you got to verify it a little no. bit every now and then. But. You got to verify. <laughs> that's a little bit. No, no. But uh, no, nah, we appreciate you again, Clint, for coming on. And, uh, you know, for those out, you, those out there listening and watching, you know, great man, great guy to get to know please go and follow them get get connected for sure absolutely appreciate y'all having me on here thanks so much clint appreciate it thank you for tuning in to beyond the game please like subscribe comment on your favorite platform it helps others find the show hey.